You know, if you like science fiction films, then there's a pretty good chance that you have already seen the 1984 film, The Terminator, starring Arnold Schwarzenegger um, as the Terminator, a cyborg assassin uh, sent back from the year 2029 to 1984 to kill Sarah Connor, whose unborn son will one day save mankind from extinction by Skynet, a hostile artificial intelligence in a post-apocalyptic future. A very realistic premise, isn't it? <laughs> all in all, there have been six Terminator movies, the most recent in 2019, but in addition to the movies, the franchise has spawned television and web series, video games, novels, comics, card games, and even thing, theme park attractions, which have generated income into the billions of dollars. Not bad for a movie that had a pre-lease low expectation. As successful, though, as the franchise has been, the Terminator could be viewed a little misleading because in the original movie, the Terminator did not complete his mission. Now, in the films that follow, the storyline becomes a lot more intense and complicated and detailed, and I could not possibly explain that to you this morning because I don't understand it myself. But the bottom line is that Sarah Connor lived and her son John was born. Now maybe I'm being a little picky, but if you're a cyborg, a cyborg from the future, and you're called the Terminator, shouldn't you terminate? <laughs> this morning, we are here to worship another Terminator. Though his story isn't grounded in science fiction, it's grounded in historical reality because what he did really did happen. And we heard it just a moment ago in the passage in 2 Timothy that Peter read for us. So if you have your Bible open uh, there again, I want to begin in verse 8. Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity, but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. The terminator in these verses is Jesus Christ, God the Son, who terminated death. Now, the New American Standard says he abolished death. Some other translations read he destroyed death. He broke the power of death. He put an end to death. He annulled death and made it no effect. Because this Greek word abolished literally means to reduce something to inactivity. It is the idea of taking away the power or the force of something, rendering it inoperative, ineffective. In other words, it means the power is gone. Earlier this week, I uh, had taken a paint stirrer and chucked it into a cordless drill, and I was mixing up some liquid lawn fertilizer. Now, I had mixed up several batches, but right in the middle of one, the drill just stopped cold. And the reason was is because the battery had been drained and it needed to be recharged. Now the battery hadn't been destroyed, but its power was gone. Jesus took the power of death away. Death was annihilated. Not annihilated, but it's been rendered inoperative and ineffective. And so the question is, how did Jesus abolish death? And the answer is he did so through his own death and resurrection. Today is Resurrection Sunday or Easter Sunday, the day we as believers in Jesus Christ celebrate the resurrection of Jesus from the grave. Now I realize that there may be some folks who object to the name Easter because it's conjectured that Easter was named after a pagan goddess of the dawn whose spring festival was held around the time of the, of the spring equinox. Amen. I think conjectured is a fair word. So just so you'll know, if I use the word Easter today, I'm talking about the resurrection of Jesus from the grave. Because central to the Christian message, to the gospel message, is the claim that Jesus did rise from the grave. But, the, but why is that so important? I mean, what does it really matter? Now, you might be a regular church attender, and you would have been here today on Sunday, Easter Sunday or not. 
And maybe there are some folks who are here or watching online, and, and frankly, you only attend church a couple times a year, Easter Sunday being one of them. I remember a pastor who said to his congregation on Easter Sunday one morning, in case I miss some of you, next time, let me go ahead and just say Merry Christmas. I, I, didn't, say, I didn't say that. <laughs> we know that today is Resurrection Sunday. That it happened, but other than being just an event in history, what does that mean to us this morning? How is it relevant to our lives today? Well, let me suggest, first of all, that the resurrection of Jesus Christ declares, affirms who he is. Jesus claimed to be God's son, and repeatedly throughout the Gospels, he called God his father. And in so doing, he was making a very significant claim about his own deity. The Bible says, for example, For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but also calling God his own Father, making himself equal to God. Did you catch that? Jesus was claiming to be equal with God. Listen to some things that Jesus said about himself. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. I am the resurrection and the life. And he who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Now, if those statements aren't strong enough for you or clear enough, then here's something else Jesus said. I and the Father are one. He who has seen me has seen the Father. The writers of the New Testament also affirm the deity of Jesus. The Apostle Paul wrote that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. The author of Hebrews testified that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his nature, and beholds all things by the word of his power. I am the resurrection and the life is a, sp a specifically significant claim because Jesus claimed that he would rise from the grave. He said that he would be killed and that he would rise again. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes be and be killed and after three days rise again. To make a promise and not deliver, to say you're going to do something and not do it, to say something's true when it really isn't, may be standard operating procedure in politics, but it's not when you make the claim to be God. Jesus said he would rise from the grave, and if he was wrong about that, then how can we believe him about anything else he said? Josh McDowell, a former atheist, wrote, If when Jesus made his claims... He knew that he was not God, then he was lying and deliberately deceiving his followers. But if he was a liar, then he was also a hypocrite, because, because he told others to be honest, whatever the cost, while he himself taught and lived a colossal lie. More than that, he was a demon, because he told others to trust in him for their eternal destiny. And if he couldn't back up his claims and knew it, then he was unspeakably evil, last he would also be a fool because it was his claims to being God that led to his crucifixion. But the testimony of the disciples, the testimony of many, many, many other eyewitnesses, the testimony of God's word is that Jesus did rise from the grave and his resurrection declares it affirms who he is. The resurrection of Jesus demonstrates the power of God we just finished what is often called Passion Week, 
which includes, among other events, Jesus' crucifixion on Good Friday. After Jesus was arrested and tried, he was taken by the Jewish religious leaders to the Roman governor Pontius Pilate. I have to confess something. When I see the name Pilate, I remember a really dumb mistake that I made several years ago when I was at a health club, and I saw a poster about joining Pilate's group. <laughs> and I wondered, what in the world is a Pilate's group? You know when your vocabulary has been influenced by Scripture when you discover that the word is Pilates, not pilot. And I'm equally glad I didn't go to the front desk and ask how to join. During his interrogation of Jesus, Pontius Pilate, though not finding sufficient reason to condemn him, felt increasing pressure by the religious leaders and the crowd to do so. The Bible says, therefore, when Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. And he entered into the praetorium again and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, you do not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and I have authority to crucify you? And Jesus answered, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given to you from above. For this reason, he who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Earlier in that same chapter, or in that same book, Jesus has said, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, so that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I receive from my Father. You see, it's really important that you understand that the entire life of Jesus Christ was always, always securely in the hands of his Father. Because in an act of supreme political maneuvering and cowardice, Pilate hands Jesus over to be crucified. He had earlier forewarned his disciples that he would be handed over to men who would crucify him. Let these words sink in your ears, for the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. That's such a significant statement. Because it reminds us this morning that the cross was not an accident the sacrifice of Jesus was not a situation having gone wrong. The death of Jesus was not a mistake, but it came from the predetermined hand of God. It was the hands of men who betrayed Jesus. It was the hands of men that arrested him and seized him in the Garden of Gethsemane. It was the hands of men that pulled out his beard. It was the hands of men that hit him on the face. It was the hands of men that jammed a crown of thorns on his head. It was the hands of men that whipped his back into shreds. It was the hand of men who mockingly put a robe on his bleeding back. It was the hands of men that put him on the cross. It was the hands of men that drove crude spikes through his hands and feet. It was the hands of men that pierced his body with a sword. But I want you to hear me. Once he had completed his mission, once salvation had been purchased, once he cried, it is finished, human hands could touch him no more. And at the end of his suffering and in the completion of his mission, Jesus yielded himself in complete confidence with a triumphal cry, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. I got to thinking that even after Jesus died, though it was the hands of men who took down the body from the cross, who anointed and wrapped it for burial, who laid it in a tomb, uh, who rolled a stone across the opening, sealing the entrance, no human hand had anything at all to do with the resurrection because that and that alone came by the hand of God. The Apostle Paul, in a prayer for believers in Ephesus, prays, I, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Now listen to this. And what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places. In describing this resurrection power, by the word, uh, Paul uses a word from which we get our English word dynamite. When he's describing God's dynamite power, he uses three other 
power descriptive words. He says, these are in accordance with the working energy of his strength. That's a power to overcome anything that stands in the way. Of his might. That's an inherent power and ability. And when I read that verse, I think of a song that we sometimes sing with kids. My, my God is so big, so strong, and so mighty, there is nothing my God cannot do. I do not know exactly how or exactly at what moment the resurrection of Jesus happened. But because it involved the awesome power of God, I have no problem speculating that he burst through the chains of death with such a spiritual explosion that it left both grave clothes and tomb intact. When the women headed to the tomb early on the first day of the week, they were going to complete the anointing of the body, and uh, the big question on their mind was, how are we going to physically roll away this stone that guards the entrance to the tomb? Taking the four Gospels in reverse order, we read in John, now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw that the stone already taken away from the tomb. Luke, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Mark, looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, although it was extremely large. And then Matthew says, and behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat on it. Listen, the stone wasn't rolled away to let Jesus out. Stones rolled away to let us take a look inside, to see that the tomb is empty, and to hear the question of the, angel, of the angels, why do you seek the living one from among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. The resurrection of Jesus declares who he is. It demonstrates the power of God. And the resurrection of Jesus destroys the power of death. The author of Hebrews wrote, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through the fear of death, were subject to slavery all of their lives. We're not going to understand the importance of the resurrection until we understand the problem of death. It all started as a result of human rebellion in the Garden of Eden when the first human couple listened to the voice of the evil one and disobeyed God. God had commanded the man, from any tree of the garden you may freely eat, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day that you eat from it, you will surely die. And I thought, what a strange word. It, it, doesn't it seem out of context? of every other aspect of God's creative ability and activity. When God had finished his creation, the Bible says, God saw that all he had created, and it was very good. God's creation teemed with life. But now here's a warning about death. You probably know what happened next. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the tree of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. That's interpretation and application. Not even touching it. The serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. And then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves loin coverings. They heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. What's death? It's in that prepositional phrase, from God. See, death is separation from God. 
The fellowship that the man and woman had previously enjoyed was now broken because of sin, and ultimately that separation is demonstrated in their expulsion from the garden, from God's paradise. Listen, the biblical concept of death is not cessation or annihilation or termination. It's separation. We are all born physically to die, which means that a day is coming when our souls are going to leave our bodies. It's going to be separated from our bodies. The Bible says that the consequence of our first parents' rebellion was, therefore, just as through one man, sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all have sinned. But folks, there's another death, a second death. And that's the separation of our soul from God for all eternity. Spiritual death or being separated from God is how we enter into this world. The Apostle Paul wrote, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, or the spirit that's now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Death is an absolute certainty for every person. No matter what a person may try to do to change the outcome, it will not work. No one escapes. Funeral homes will always have business, and cemeteries will always need more space. The minute our lives begin, we are headed for the grave. Death is an unavoidable problem. Now, science and technology can't solve the problem of death. I found some humor, some enjoyment in reading an article about cryonics. Uh, a person said, the idea of preserving your corpse not only to be brought back to life and cured later seems ingenious, fascinating, a totally plausible, and a good idea to many people. Cryonics is the process that immediately after being declared dead, the body is frozen in an effort to preserve it, keeping all the organs and cell structures intact. The thought behind this is that future science will eventually be able to treat the cause, causes of death. So the body is thawed, fixed up in some sort of futuristic cryo jiffy lube, and you're flying your space car home before dinner. That's the theory. Believing in the possibility and actually going through with the process is an exercise in idiocy. Religion can't solve the problem of death because there is no religious commitment or devotion that's going to keep you out of the grave. Religious leaders can't solve the problem of death even if you count Peter as the first one, we are currently at number 266, Pope. And uh, even though we're f that far down the line, uh, he's not the last one. Muhammad is buried in Mecca, Confucius is still in a grave, and Joseph Smith is dead in a coffin. Even Abraham, Moses, and David, and all the apostles are dead. You can't solve the problem of death because it requires a source outside of yourselves. And no matter how sincere you are or how hard you try, you are powerless to change the inevitable. The consequences of sin is death, and the one who has the power of death is the evil one. Not that he has power over death, but that he had the sovereignty or dominion of death. He had a sovereignty of which death is the realm. But I want you to notice something really important. In this verse we read just a moment ago, the author of Hebrews said that the evil one had the power of death, not has the power of death. Because there's one thing and there's one thing only that ripped it out of his control, and that's the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus rendered powerless. By the way, the same word that Paul uses in Timothy when he says Jesus abolished death. Jesus rendered powerless. Him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Dr. John MacArthur explains the only way to destroy Satan was to rob him of his weapon, death. Physical death, spiritual death, eternal death. Satan knew that God required death for us because of sin. Death had become the most certain fact of life. Satan knew that men, if they remained as they were, would die and go out of God's presence into hell forever. Satan wants to hold on to men until they die. Because once they are dead, the opportunity for salvation is gone forever. Men cannot escape after death. So God had to wrest from Satan the power of death. And for that purpose, Jesus came. 
Satan's weapon is extremely powerful, but God has a weapon even more powerful, eternal life, and with it, Jesus destroyed death. The resurrection of Jesus Christ provides the believer with eternal life. It's the only thing that could have ever done it. Death is the power of Satan's dominion. And when Jesus shattered Satan's power, he also shattered his dominion. Spiritual death can't hold the believer in Jesus. And physical death can't keep the body in the grave. The resurrection of Jesus has broken the chains of fear and slavery and set us free. Yes, we are born into this world as sinners separated from God. But that same passage in Ephesians says, but God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not a result of works, lest anyone should boast. Arnold Schwarzenegger may have been the terminator, but Jesus Christ is the detonator. The resurrection of Jesus declares who he was. It demonstrates the power of God. It destroys the power of death, and the resurrection of Jesus delivers a promise for the future. Let's go back just for a second to that last part of our text in 2 Timothy, who, speaking of Jesus, says, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Jesus brought life and immortality. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. The resurrection of Jesus guarantees the resurrection for every believer in Jesus. The Apostle Paul wrote, But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, after that those who are Christ's at his coming. Do you know what first fruits are? In the Old Testament law, the first ripe fruit was called the first fruit, and it was given to God as an offering. For example, no grain was to be harvested at all until all of the first fruits were brought to the Lord. First fruits were the first of the rest of the harvest. Paul says that Jesus is the first fruits, the first of the rest. Others rose from the dead and died again, but not with Jesus. He is the first to conquer death and never die again. Jesus is the preliminary installment of what will both be the example and the guarantee of more to come. When Jesus was raised from the dead, it was God's assurance to us that we will also be raised from the dead at a future harvest. It reminds me of a little five-year-old boy who was riding along in a car with his dad. They drove past a cemetery, and they noticed a large pile of dirt by a newly excavated grave and the boy pointed and said look dad one got out <laughs> listen folks one did get out and because he got out every follower of Jesus is going to get out he's not the first he's the first but not the last and because of Christ's sacrifice and resurrection Jesus Christ not only abolished death but he brought life and immortality to light what that means for you and I and for every believer in Jesus Christ is that death is not the end. It is the doorway leading into our entrance in the presence of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There was a school teacher who was assigned to visit a, a, a children in a large city hospital. There was one child she was told that she absolutely had to visit. She took the boy's name and the room number and and was told by uh, his teacher on the other end of the phone, uh, we're studying nouns and adverbs in class. I'd be grateful if you could help him with his homework so he won't fall behind the others. It wasn't until this visiting teacher got outside the boy's room that she realized it was located in the hospital's burn unit. No one had prepared her to find a young boy who was in such horrible pain and who had been so severely burned. She went into the room and, 
when she saw that, she wanted to leave, but she felt like she just couldn't turn around and walk out. And so she stammered awkwardly, I, I'm the hospital teacher, and your teacher has sent me here to help you with nouns and adverbs. The boy was in so much pain that he could hardly respond, and this young teacher took him through the English lesson, ashamed at, at putting him through what seemed to be such a sinless exercise. The next morning, a nurse on the burn unit asked her, what did you, what did you do to that boy? And before the teacher could finish her outbursts of apologies, the nurse interrupted her and said, no, no, you don't understand. We've been very worried about him, but ever since you were here yesterday, his whole attitude has changed. He's fighting back. He's responding to treatment. It's as if he's decided to live. The boy later explained that he had completely given up hope until he saw that teacher. And it all changed when he came to this simple realization, and with joyful tears, the boy said, they wouldn't send a teacher to work on nouns and adverbs with a boy who was dying, would they? All around us is pain and suffering and brokenness caused by sin and death. But on the other side is the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus rose from the grave and abolished death and brought life and immortality to light. Because he lives, we too shall live. That means there's hope for the present and there's hope for the future. And on Resurrection Sunday, we have reason to celebrate. Jesus Christ is risen. Let's pray together.